We're here at Google this afternoon with Aga Maderska, and we're going to be talking about some of the theoretical models of computation, such as the finite state machine. Aga, thank you ever so much for having us here this afternoon and giving up some of your time. Let's get started. What is a finite state machine? Um, so I think the most important thing about a finite state machine is that is it's not really a machine. It's just a theoretical okay. abstraction here. Um, so it's a it's a way of trying to understand programs and machines um, with a, with a pen and a piece of paper that that makes it easier. Um, so if you think about it, a lot of the systems that we work with are always in some sort of a state. They're on. They're off. They're showing a particular screen. Um, you, you can see a state that's described there, and that state changes based on uh, various triggers, uh, user interactions, uh, certain conditions. And that can be quite easily imagined as a graph where, where you've got state bubbles and then you've got arrows which indicate transition. So it's just a, a, a really easy way to describe a, a physical system or, a, or an idea that you have. It's also applicable to more theoretical things like programming languages where, or, or execution of a programming um, piece of code. So you have any program in a particular state and then based, based on what the user does or based on certain calculations within the program, the program changes state. So let, think a little more about some of these practical real world examples. Can you talk us through one of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for example, my team and, and me, uh, we specialize in working uh, with user interfaces and we work a lot with, with our graphic, uh, graphic designers, that, that's a whole team. Um, and very often we have to design exactly what I described a little bit earlier. So we need to have a system that displays a number of screens and uh, for to the user on the screen on wearable devices or on mobile devices. And um, you move between those screens based on what the user does. So if a user presses this button, we go to a separate screen. If a user presses another button, we go to a different screen. And that is quite naturally modeled um, by a finite state machine because you have a finite number of screens and then you have also a finite number of transitions between these screens. So in, for, the, for the designers, it's easy to, to, to just depict it in this way. And also for us as, as the programmers, it's really easy to translate into code. Okay, and typically then, if you're developing for wearable tech or for a smartphone, you might think in terms of the design of the states and the transition first yeah. rather than underlying algorithms. Uh, yes, okay. correct. Correct. So this, this is quite often um, in our team becoming the design pattern for user interfaces and data flowing throughout. Um, it's not, it, it's really early days of, of these interactions, but we're, we're looking into kind of trying to formalize that as a team. And we have, as you say, the, the finite state machine is this, this theoretical abstraction of computation, but this obviously does have practical applications. Can students at secondary school get involved in that sort of practical coding side to, to finite yes, state machines? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think it's actually a very good idea because um, representing something as a graph on paper with, with your pen is just such a natural thing to do. Okay. And this is a way that you operate in the normal world as well, right? You are presented, you are in a certain situation, you're in a certain state, and then you do something and your state or situation changes. Right. So I think it's a very natural way of thinking about problems. And then translating that into code, especially in object-oriented mm -hmm. programming, is, is very natural. So a state is your separate class or object, and then transitions are the inputs that you get from, from the user through a user interface. Okay, so perhaps whilst in a, a procedural imperative language, one might think of designing an algorithm as pseudocode or as flowcharts. When it comes to something like this, a design of algorithm is actually the graph that, that encodes the states and transitions. Um, so I think a flowchart is a very good example of, of it, it's very close to finite state okay, machines, right? right? So because yeah. a flowchart um, is related in the sense that it's saying, oh, if, if you do this, this will happen. Okay. 
uh, what, what the link that you need here is that it changes the state of the program. So particular variables uh, suddenly hold different values. Yeah. Um, certain Boolean variables are true yes. or not true, depending on what changes. So I think algorithm analysis mm -hmm. is very often done through finite state machines uh, right. or Turing okay. machines. Yes. Algorithm design, not so much, because design, like the algorithms are, are the code that's flowing. It's not yeah. a system. Ah, so but it, mean, but it changes so the levels state. of abstraction, I suppose, <laughs> the, within... You, the classes that you're writing to, to implement. The, the so the, the, the algorithm to... the algorithm is often the transition okay. bit between the states of the program. So if you would if you would um, wish you could say that at the very high top level you've got a system mm. or a program, um, and that is described by a finite state machine, then lower below you've yeah. got algorithms that govern different parts of the right. program and those yes. algorithms influence the state that the program is okay. in yes it's and that's levels of yeah. detail there. <laughs> exactly yes. yeah. we need to think of several of those at the same time um you could yeah. but to, to be honest if you divide it into thinking about the okay. states and the transitions between yes. the states then you can handle the states and the transitions one at a time oh, really as 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 long as you design, you, as as you, if you first design the whole system. Yes, yes, and that's yeah. a, that's certainly something we're wanting to emphasize in, in school about think first, code like. Correct. <laughs> yes, yes, and I think I think finite state machines are a very good way of doing this because mm -hmm. they are they are a natural thinking pattern, um, and so it's very easy to start with that and then go into the details right. of the implementation. Okay. Now you mentioned the, the Turing machine. Can you explain what a Turing machine is? Yeah, so a Turing machine is in a way uh, where it all started, or, or the halting problem, which I'll talk about okay. in, in a little bit. But the Turing machine is um, a little bit like a finite state machine, except that it's a little bit more powerful. So uh, a finite state machine just only ever has one state, while the Turing machine operates on infinite memory. So it, it remembers um, things that it has done in the past, mm. whereas a, a finite state machine, not really. It just remembers okay. the state it's currently in and what, what triggers or what ways can it take to move to another state. Um, so a Turing machine is this very powerful um, theoretical model uh, described by Alan Turing in, in 1936 um, to, to prove um, the unsolvability of the halting Okay, really. we're going to have to explain what the whole yeah. problem is. So the, the whole thing problem is, uh, is, is a problem that we bumped into when, the, when computer science first started um, and people started coding programs. So it didn't really start with design, it started with, <laughs> with coding and, and trying to figure out how yeah. to make machines uh, do stuff for us. And then people realized that some programs don't stop. Okay. And Alan Turing spent a lot of his time trying to figure out this problem. And in the end, um, he did figure out that this is an unsolvable problem. So there is no general algorithm that can be applied to any pair, any pair of um, inputs and algorithms um, that can guarantee that this particular algorithm under this particular input will finish or not. So, so it's not true to say that if we can think of something, then we can write code for it. Um, well, that's no, that's that's okay. not that's, that's not, not the same thing. thing. That's not the same thing. <laughs> okay. So I think you can you can pretty much work out um, code for most practical okay. applications. Uh, but there's this one example. This one relatively impractical exactly. application. Exactly. Okay. Correct. Right. That you can't write a program that will determine if a program any arbitrary program can finish or not. Okay. And as part of that solution, Turing devised a theoretical theoretical machine, which was called the Turing machine. Yes. That was very basic. It had um, a read operation, a write operation, and it could move into different parts of its own memory, and the memory was infinite. Um, and based on that, uh, he, he proved that you can't actually write that one particular program. <laughs> So this was a theoretical problem that he was setting out to yeah. solve with a theoretical machine as part of his solution. Yes, that. correct. Did that machine then influence the development of actual physical computers later on? Um, it definitely 
so the physical computers were kind of like present before. Okay. Um, so he, he, he did develop a, little, a lot of theory about the, how the computers operate. Mm. Um, I think more than the physical machines, he influenced the design of programming languages. Ah, right, okay. So uh, languages can be described. So, so a Turing machine obviously needs a language to operate on. It needs an alphabet. It so this isn't to... so much the design of, of, of hardware as the design of a, a system that does computation. Correct. That's why I always yeah. think like naming it the machine is a little bit misleading okay. because it has yes. very little to do with actual hardware. In fact, you can, you can't build a practical Turing machine because out of infinite memory is. Giant you, you, so you you can't, but if you you can build a very good approximation with Lego blocks, even there's a there's a YouTube video on that. It's very entertaining. Thank you. <laughs> so it's the simplest computer out there. Um, if you kind of ignore the infinite memory um, uh, constraint, uh, but programming languages in theory, have infinite memory. It's the hardware that's limiting, right? right? So yeah. when you're designing a programming language. Uh, you take into account that the possibilities that the Turing machine give machine gives okay, you. Okay, is this, are, this are, idea of Turing completeness as a property of that language? Exactly. That, yeah, yeah, that's that's where I'm um, going to. So, so <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that, that's, that's that's fine. Um, so the, a system is Turing complete where it can when it can do anything that a Turing machine can do. And a Turing machine can pretty much do anything. It's mm. just a very, very general machine. It's supposed okay. it was designed to um, describe all possible algorithms, except that one. Okay. <laughs> right. right? So uh, people naturally thought that the most po powerful languages would be Turing complete languages. Mm. So languages that kind of model or simulate how, how a Turing machine operates. And um, there's a lot of theoretical maths going mm. into programming design, programming language design, to make sure that they are as powerful as the Turing machine. Yes, because once you establish that the language is Turing complete, you essentially establishing that it can solve or pretty, implement pretty much pretty any algorithm much that any other. Yeah, and Turing maybe more or less efficient, but okay. at least yes. it's powerful yes. it's, and, and it's possible. Um, so, that, but that means also that there's this one constraint that you can't design that algorithm to determine if you uh, do actually finish the program in some finite yeah. time or, or not, or yes. does it go in an infinite loop. And um, that led people to design languages that are on purpose not exactly Turing complete for applications where you don't really care about an infinite interaction, but you, would, you really care about always, always getting a result. So the, there is a separate branch of programming languages, very few, but there are, and they're very interesting, where you can, where you can, where you can guarantee that the program will always finish, mm -hmm. or, or not finish, but <laughs> that, that is solvable, and those, those systems are nearly, <laughs> nearly complete, but not really. <laughs> okay, a lot of these ideas are, are very high level and, and seem very theoretical. Are there practical ways that teachers can bring these alive in their classroom? Yeah, I think I think starting with finite state machines is a, is a really good idea because that is that is as I said before a very practical way yes. of thinking, yes. a very natural yeah. way of thinking, and then can easily get to the students. And once they have a good grasp of the finite state machine, I think the question you ask is what happens if the number of states is infinite? Okay. So why <laughs> why do we need to think about that? Think about natural languages, for example. Uh, German or English or Polish or any other language, they are different from pro programming languages for, for some reasons. Um, but when trying to describe real languages, we actually came up with a really good description of programming languages. Oh. And that's Noam Chomsky's work. Oh, Apart interesting. from all the controversial work he has done. <laughs> he, uh, he actually said about, he is a linguist, yes. he said about for trying to define a system to describe any language out there, any natural spoken language in the world, but he ended up bringing about a very good set of rules on designing uh, artificial programming languages. So I think that's... So a, there are, that's a there good are rules which all languages obey? 
The, but, most yeah. programming languages, yes, because they need to be understand understood by by computers. Yes. And computers aren't they do, don't have an intuition for what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think taking this angle and trying to like show show uh, children and students how it actually links with the real world. Yeah. Um, is, is a good approach. It's a good start. <laughs> really? and, and there you can start talking about Turing machines and theoretical models yes. and, and programming language design and language design. And it will be very interesting for linguists as well. Mm, in in mm. fact, Google does employ a lot of linguists um, for this reasons, because we try and analyze voice patterns, yeah. voice, speech patterns. Yeah. We try and synthesize spoken spoken languages as well yes. when we read out texts and 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 here the knowledge the linguists have and sort of overlap deep rules of <laughs> yeah. how language works yeah. rather than any particular yeah language. yes exactly yeah. yeah so i i think it's interesting not only for programmers <laughs> yes no, brilliant yeah. um, and your work at google does that draw on any of these ideas uh, it does a little bit on finite state machines mm -hmm. so we i personally as i said before we work on user interfaces yes, and front end yes. client design of, of mobile and wearable applications. Yeah. And, um, and you will start with drawing the, the finite state yes. machine, the graph. Well, we would often do that. Yeah. So in, in practice, we would start with anything that works. Then we would then very pragmatic. <laughs> then we, once we have a working prototype, we go to our designers and and, and ask, well, could you please make this pretty <laughs> and logical and you know very user intuitive? And very often they come up um, uh, with very uh, again intuitive graphs. Um, yes. and flowcharts of how the user is going to move throughout the system. Mm. And then we take that, that work and translate it into a finite state machine. Um, again, on, on a piece of paper very often, mm -hmm. and then into code. And this is useful for testing this is software as well as, as implement? Uh, yes, that's a, yeah. that's a very good point. It is actually very useful for testing. It makes it a lot easier to test because you can set a program before the test to be in a particular state yeah. and then trigger, um, so set in a particular trigger and then check if it goes to the expected state. So that also, yes, kind of has a clear division be be yeah. between the user interface, the logic governing the user interface and the data flowing. Yes. So yeah, that's <laughs> really definitely, definitely useful for testing. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think I'd like to just encourage teachers to to take a closer look at finite state machines and look at the practical applications because there's a lot of theory behind it. Um, it can get quite complicated, yeah. uh, but we also use it a lot in practice. Okay, thank you so much for this. That's been really very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.